This is KGW News at 5. Oregon Governor Kate Brown is changing the metrics for COVID risk by county. Right now, no counties are classified as extreme risk. Hello, friends. Welcome to KGW News at 5 o'clock. I'm Laurel Porter. And I'm Dan Haggerty. Counties can now only be added to extreme risk if COVID patients are occupying 300 or more hospital beds. And there's been a 15% increase in the seven day hospital hospitalization average over the past week. That metric hasn't been reached, so several counties that would be extreme risk will stay in high risk. There are no counties in the extreme risk right now. Six counties are moving from moderate risk to high risk, and that includes Multnomah and Clackamas counties. Governor Brown also announced today every Oregonian 16 and older will be eligible for a COVID vaccine April 19th. It's roughly two weeks earlier than planned and in line with the president's updated timeline. But being eligible and getting a shot are two very different things. Pat Doris reports the state is about to see the supply cut in half. This current week is a record breaker for Oregon in terms of COVID vaccines shipped into the state. More than 220,000 doses. And that includes 120,000 of the one shot Johnson and Johnson. But the surge will quickly end and significantly lower numbers will follow with an unknown impact on the immunization plan. Two weeks ago, the Oregon Health Authority expected that starting April 10th, Oregon would get 250,000 doses of vaccine each week and every week into May. Now it appears those numbers will be cut by 60 percent, with only 100,000 doses expected to arrive. Dave Baden is in charge of the Oregon vaccine rollout and said this current week is indeed a record. OK, so but in the next two weeks after that, you're saying the supply will essentially be cut in half. Yeah, and and and, and I, I really think that that's the the Johnson and Johnson, um, you know, up and down and not having uh, great insight of when that is going to happen. Johnson and Johnson had a problem in an East Coast factory that caused 15 million doses to be tossed out and temporarily halted future shipments. J&J &J doses already in Oregon are safe. Baden said it's unclear how long Oregon will be getting the lower number of vaccine doses, but it almost certainly means there will not be enough for the estimated 1 million people who become eligible April 19th. The challenge will be is there will be some traffic jams. Um, it was going to be traffic jams on May 1st. There'll be traffic jams on April 19th of of how many doses coming into the state and, you know, frankly, how many doses that are being produced by vaccine manufacturers. It's unclear if the state will even hit its goal of giving everyone 16 and over at least one dose by the first week of June. In the meantime, the traffic jam is already here. This was the OHSU website struggling for a second day as 11,000 people crammed into a vaccine scheduling site designed for 4,800, everybody trying to grab one of 5,700 appointments. The site was glitchy and often did not work right. Hannah Rote was one of those struggling to get a slot. It was just error after error. And um, then finally I was in and it was a little uh, loading icon and I could see appointments, but it wouldn't let me grab them. And then it would crash and say, sorry, our server crashed. And so I just kept trying. And then eventually I got an appointment um, uh, for tomorrow. And then I went to the next step and it crashed again. Hannah said a friend later helped her get an appointment. If you missed the action this morning, not to worry, you'll have more chances. OHSU says it's going to open the website again tomorrow morning and Thursday morning at 9 a.m., giving away up to 6,000 appointments each day. In Northeast Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. Oregon State University is working on COVID research that could help develop better treatments and vaccines. And one of the student researchers is reaching tens of thousands of people online, explaining complicated science through dance. She shared more with Galen Etlin. Heather Mason Forsyth is passionate about dance and uses it in science. She's a fifth year PhD candidate at Oregon State University, researching biochemistry and biophysics. This video is important for understanding viral replication and viron structure. Dances through her team's research into a specific part of the COVID-19 virus. The nucleocapsid phosphoprotein. Easy for her to say. 
basically the structure that protects the virus. More structured proteins are rigid, locked in place for their specific role. Her dance video showcasing her PhD research won a national contest through Science Magazine. More disordered proteins are flexible, sampling many states. So why try to understand this? If you were trying to work on a car, you would want to know what the engine looks like. She says these proteins help the virus bind, remain stable, and ultimately infect people. What kind of things were you hoping to find? You could, in theory, develop a drug compound that disrupts that interaction, and now all of a sudden the protein can't do its job, completely destroy the virus. Sounds like a good call. Uh, that would be ideal, yes. It is, of course, incredibly complex. But Heather is all about breaking down the complex. Her TikTok account called Hey Curly Top has nearly 50,000 followers. She showcases her team's findings, answering scientific questions through dance and easy to understand text. Dance and science are ultimately just storytelling to communicate whatever it is you're trying to communicate to your audience. Many nucleocapsid proteins start to attach using their structured regions. She says they now know a lot more about how proteins help COVID survive, but there are still questions about how a drug could work. Would disrupt the virus's ability to replicate. Ultimately, her art brings more people to the table. The general public has followed and become involved in science more than ever before, giving scientists a unique opportunity to share their work and talk about the scientific process. And shows the reality. What does this mean to you? It feels uh, both exciting and terrifying sort of all the time. Science at the speed of sound. Galen Etlin, KGW News. Just wow, how impressive is that? I love it. Well, more students in the Portland metro area started hybrid learning this week. On Monday, the Beaverton School District welcomed back its youngest students, kids in pre-K through second grade. We spoke with a kindergarten teacher at Raleigh Park Elementary about how her first day went. Out of her 27 kindergartners, 20 of them came back for in-person hybrid learning. I was so impressed with how they were able to wear their masks the whole time and stay at a distance. They're so excited to be back and they really want to do a good job and they, they want to be there. So they're doing a great job with all of those safety protocols. Data from the district shows that on average about 48% of families with kids in elementary school chose the hybrid learning option. The Beaverton School District plans to begin hybrid for middle school students on April 19th, then high school students a few days later on the 22nd. The Hawthorne Bridge is going to be closed this weekend so the crews can inspect some cracks in the drawbridge area. County officials say that there are cracks in parts of the towers that rotate when the drawbridge goes up and down, and each of them supports about a million pounds, so they're important. Inspectors noticed these cracks, these cracks last fall, so they need to close that bridge and give them a closer look. So it'll be closed from 7 a.m. Saturday as late as 7 p.m. Sunday, and they'll be fixing the bridge, they say, sometime in the next two years. Now we have an update tonight for you on the off-duty Forest Grove police officer accused of terrorizing a family. This all started last fall when a drunken stranger attacked a home out of nowhere. The family who lives there says that he seemed angry about the Black Lives Matter flag that was hanging on the front of their house. And he turns, sees me, and he just comes at me, and I slam the door. I lock it. Um, he starts trying to get in. He starts, you know, just trying to turn the knob, get into the house. He's kicking it. He's banging on the, the house. When he sees he can't get in, we're screaming at him to, you know, get out of there. The family later learned the police had arrested a guy. And in fact, the suspect was this man, a cop himself. He's Officer Stephen Teets with the Forest Grove PD. But that detail, his name and his job, they were hidden from the family for days. And that caught the attention of a retired journalist who just couldn't let the story go. You know, it just seemed like, what is going on here? Is this like a deliberate cover up of something? Because they sensed that a kind of racist charge would be darker, you know, than criminal mischief or disorderly conduct. And it would just taint him in a way that would be more difficult. And they're trying to protect him from that. Now, the digging that she did produced major changes. Teach faces criminal charges. His trial starts this summer. 
Other officers are on leave after all this. The Washington County Sheriff's Office has implemented training to help victims in cases where cops are in the wrong. And Forest Grove PD is under investigation for how they handle Teet's arrest in the first place. We're going to dig into this a whole lot more and how it all unfolded tonight at 6 o'clock on The Story.